We're an espresso chocolate chip. I don't know if you're healthy, but I'll drink it. Yeah, espresso. Okay. Uh, I'll fun. eat it in my chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yes, today is the long promised conclusion of what we would call the Oracles of Judgment. Right. So we've been working on these for a while. Really, chapters 1 through 24 were against Israel. Then you have 25 through 32 were oracles of judgment against the Gentiles. No one is excluded from God's judgment, not even Dorothy. She's not, she wants to drink the water. So. Um, but remember, why are they judged? All the multiple ways that God you know, illustrated this, right? It's always judgment for the same reason. What would you say? Because they didn't do the right things? Unbelief. No, it's an unbelief. Right? Now, their rebellious life is, is evidence of their rebellious life. Of unrepentance. repentance. Yeah, there's no repentance. Exactly. Right? Now, re remember, repentance, uh, we sometimes get confused about this, uh, repentance mean, does not mean an amendment of life. Now, that's, um, that's how Rome understood it, because they, um, most of their teaching came out of St. Jerome's translation of the Bible into Latin, called the Vulgate, murder of the Vulgate. Uh, so the Vulgate translates, often translates repentance as do penance. That's how it gets translated in English. Yeah, so, you know, the Roman Church has this thing called penance. That's when, like, you go and confess your sins. The pastor may or may not say, you're forgiven. Uh, but, it's, but no matter what, he's going to say, do these things to make amends, right? Both before God and the one he sinned against. If it sins against. Right, so we so many help Mary, so many our fathers, that's the spiritual one. Uh, but then acts of charity or love or restitution, right? So if you've taken, defrauded, then you would restore them all, you know, even if you're a three-fold or four-fold right? So the law, right? Now, uh, restitution, amendment of life, um, and spiritual restoration are all good gifts from God. I mean, that, like, you see this with uh, famously with Zacchaeus, right? Jesus comes to his house, he's forgiven. Zacchaeus goes, that, without even Jesus' prompting, says, Oh, I'm going to restore fourfold what, what I have been right? I can't help it doing now because I'm forgiven. I, you're not holding it against me, so why, would I, why do I need the money, right? I mean, I don't need it. It was there in the first place. Hey, I'm going to be generous with that, but give me more. Total change of heart, right? Uh, but repentance uh, begins first with confession, and uh, it has two parts, actually, is how we confess it uh, in our confessions. First, that we're contrite, and second, that we confess our sins. And then, as, as the small catechism says, and receive absolution, that is forgiveness. So repentance includes confessing one's sins, out of sorrow, but also receiving absolution. It doesn't seem they want any of that, whether it's Jew or Gentile. Now, Gentiles, you can give a little bit of an excuse to, right? Because, you know, they only heard God's word through, like, say, for example, an Egyptian. Pharaoh only heard it by way of Moses. Moses, you know, he's the, well, he had been in Pharaoh's household, right? Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. All right, so, no repentance. No confession of sin, but forgiveness of sin. Maybe a little bit of an introduction before we read them. Uh, we're not going to read the whole chapter. I don't think today we have a lot of things to talk about. So far, the bulk of the book has accented God's judgment on Israel. Oh, you know, I haven't done this for a while, have I? I've been talking, and I forgot that, like, if anybody's ever going to try to listen or watch this online, they are going to be prefer me to have a microphone on. All right. I'm going to walk back here and make sure it connected. These are all things that... I'm gone one week, and then everything breaks. If you were in church last week, I think you noticed that. I don't know what didn't work. Microphones didn't work. Who knows? Cameras weren't working. Nothing was working. You had a power outage, I think. It's on, it's, it's on the website, yeah. No video, though. Just audio. Yeah. I did my best to clean it up. Yeah, I couldn't either. All right. So what were we talking about? Yes, the sheet. Thank you. So far, the bulk of the book has accented God's judgment on Israel and on the heathen nations. We talked about that. In contrast, the rest of the book, 33 through 48, 
will usually speak of God's grace to the new Israel that will consist of regenerate believers endowed with the Spirit under the new, their new, a new David as their shepherd, prince, and king. And I gave you some examples of where that will be obvious to you. It is, uh, yeah, it should be, it is unfortunate that selected portions of these chapters are often the only ones given much attention in the church. We've talked about this. How many of you had read any of the first part of Ezekiel that we've read so far? Yeah, it's, and it's not in the lectionary, so we don't even hear it read in public assembly, right? But we do hear about the dry bones, right? And we hear about the shepherd of the sheep, right? Okay. And the heart of stone for a heart of flesh, yeah. So we hear those texts, but we don't hear the ones previous to that. Uh, where was I going? As though a full-body gospel could be proclaimed without an in-depth attention to the law. So in other words, having slogged through 32 chapters of pretty severe law with only brief either implied or hints of gospel throughout, the law, will, the, the law has done its work, right? And we're all, we recognize we're all condemned under sin, right? And, and certainly Israel would have known that, those in exile and those not. And, uh, but then the gospel is all the more sweeter of, of being restored again, right? Because you recognize really what's going on. By the way, this chapter that we're going to look at is largely uh, recapitulation. We're hearing things again, recaps that we've already heard before. So the first few verses, nine verses, basically are parallel to chapter 3 in the call of Ezekiel. Um, verses 10 through 20 is pretty much the same as chapter 18, 21 to 25. Then uh, a note, the dialectic of judgment and salvation, law and gospel, extends through the entire scriptures. So here's the key. The key to understanding the watchman oracles, we're going to have a few of them, is the apocal report of verses 33, 21 to 22. And that's as far as we're going to get today. The city has fallen. It marks a major turn in the book and Ezekiel's ministry and Israel's history. The watchman's responsibility is both law and gospel. We remember Jesus' words. What I say to you, I say to all. Watch, Mark 13. All right, and then I would suggest this chapter is parallel to Christ's death on the cross. So when he says the city has fallen, that's Jesus saying it is finished. Right, and there's other parallels we could make. So it's a big transition. We're going to have a, kind of an epilogue here in the first, first section of all of the ministry of doom. I like that. Wasn't that a... Ministry? Harry Potter. Harry Potter. No, no, I want to say, I think it's ministry, ministry of Doom. I think it's like a Prodigy album or something. Anyway, Legion of Doom. Was that the Prodigy with the, the Legion of Doom album? Or is there's the DC thing? Anyway, all right, anyway. Old Ministry of Doom, but also holds out the very real possibility of repentance and a future under God, which we'll see um, in a few verses. Okay. Now, one thing to note here, um, well, maybe I'll hold off on that. We'll, when we, I'll wait until we get to it. So let's read the first section here. What's on the screen is probably good enough. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon the land and the people of the land, take a man from among them and make him their watchman. And when he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows the trumpet to warn the people, that if anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet does not take warning, and the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and did not take warning, his blood shall be upon himself. But if he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, so that the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes away any of them, that person is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. Go through verse 9. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die. And if you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity. All right, so like I said, uh, that's all should sound very familiar to you, except when did we look at chapter 3? Anybody have it on their calendar? <laughs> Pastor started the book of Ezekiel, yeah. 
it's got to be more than four months. Was it the new year? I'm pretty sure we started with the new this, year. This is really important to me, so I'm going to look it up. We did, we did chapter 8 in December. So, oh my. Yeah, oh my. Hey, you was last year. Yeah, that's true. There's Don's got a good point. Yeah, if if we're doing a chapter a week and we, that wasn't even true. We had some weeks where we spread it out yeah. or we took a week off. So if I you you really want to know, so I'm going to look it up. Catechesis. How far do I have to scroll? <laughs> Way back. I know we had a week or two of introduction. Because you were in chapter 8 when I came back for... Uh, Zechariah was in May. Still in May. Oh, I went too far. Look at that. Zechariah is still in May. September we were doing Zechariah. We started Ezekiel. Introduction in... What does that say? December. No, it is December. No, that's not right. That's October. I can't read. It was the last week of September. So the last time you heard this was on October 30th, 2022. <laughs> all right. So maybe it's not that familiar to you. Since it's been almost a year, right? Yeah, a couple months short of that, 10 months ago. But this was, this was the call narrative of Ezekiel. Hey, that's kind of interesting. Chapter 3, chapter 33. Maybe it's an easy way to remember it, right? Um, so this was when he was sent to call, to, to preach... That was telling him what was going to happen moving forward, right? Now we get a repeat of it to say, by the way, this is what Ezekiel has been all about all these many years. Preaching and teaching. And some people will hear it. Some people won't. Some people will receive it. Some won't. The judgment comes upon the prophet if he fails to preach. But the judgment comes upon the people if they fail to listen, right? That's what, that, basically the summary of what just happened here. Make sense? So this is a, actually kind of a helpful touch point, even though it's really just kind of a recap. Um, you need recaps periodically, right? You need to come back and say, okay, what were we doing this whole time? What was this all about? God sent Ezekiel to preach these oracles of judgment that they would repent and live. That's the goal. It's always been the goal the whole time through. And he's going to make that explicit here in a few verses. All right. Um, but, at, but since we were so bogged down in 32 chapters of judgment, we probably might, well, I tried to help as we went through to recognize, no, this is about repentance for the forgiveness of sins, even though it wasn't always explicit, right? All right. So uh, let's see what else can be said here. Uh, when I bring, not if, yeah. So, he actually says if. He does both, right. So when I bring the sword upon the land, Right? So that's a for sure thing. It's not if, it's when. Right? So we talked about that in the sermon today. If you didn't catch, there was a little Ezekiel, um, Ezekiel style preaching there going on. Like God's going to take from you the things you love. <laughs> it's like, that's the kind of God we have. And we forget that, that he is um, the Lord of Lords and sovereign over all creation. And he's constantly at work. He's not absent. It's not, it's not on us. Um, not on us maybe alone to preserve life, liberty, and happiness, but actually that it's, it's actually uh, on God to do that, right? And that he, maybe he uses us to do that, but Dorothy, you need to be quiet, please. Okay. All right. Um, so when, and when he sees, the watchman, the sword coming on the land, if, now the if. So there's going to be a conditional result. Not whether God's going to bring the sword, but what does the prophet do? You got that? So you want to distinguish between the wins and the ifs. Let's see if there's another one. If the sword comes and takes him away, his own blood will be on his head. Why? Why would it take him away? Because he doesn't warn the people. Right? So we're just getting this back. But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and the people are not warned, um, then he is to be taken away. And the blood will be required at the watchman's hand. By the way, also note, notable here, because this is similar to what Jesus says in Matthew 18, something like that, about how, we heard this not that long ago, you know, about the, let the little children come to me, don't forbid them, right? It'd be better for, for the one who 
forbids the little children to come to Jesus, that a millstone be tied around his neck and he be thrown to the bottom of the sea. All right? Now that was with the children, but it sound, it's the same judgment if they fail to speak and protect the children, right? Um, with, or to deliver God's word to them. Here, it's if they fail to warn them and tell them that God's sword's coming, repent and live, the judgment will be upon the prophet. But will the people still be judged for their sin? Yes. But now everybody's being condemned, not just the people, but also the prophet. All right. So there is a consequence for false prophecy, which you probably heard from Pastor Courtright last week, I imagine, because it was wolf in sheep's clothing, right? Yeah. And what's the consequence of false doctrine? You're not delivered from your sins, <laughs> ultimately, right? All right. Um, but then, so you, son of man, so now it's specifically, not abstractly, about, about watchmen, but specifically Ezekiel, the watchman, right? I have made you watchmen for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. So there you have the, very similar to what we have in the apostolic office, you have here in the prophetic office. Jesus speaks, I say what Jesus said. Jesus speaks, the prophet says what Jesus said. Same thing, right? It's a delegate authority, but it's a delegate word too, right? The prophet's not given to say things that God hasn't spoken. And we've talked at length about this in various contexts, but it's, it's worth reiterating here. Dorothy, shh. It's worth reiterating here is that we, we, we actually must be very cautious about not saying what God hasn't said, right? So I, there was a little note about that in the sermon about, well, if you lose the thing and you don't know why, God hasn't told you that belongs to his hidden will. That doesn't mean he didn't take it from you. We just don't, you just don't know why, right? <laughs> And what, do you, what can you say about that? Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's what Job teaches us, right? Like, I don't know why, but it must be God's will, right? Yeah. So we don't know, you know, let's say, because you said sometimes he'll take the things that you oh. love or make, make your God. Right. Which could be anything. Yep. I mean, we don't always necessarily know then, well, did we make that our God? Or we, you know, if he took something? I, I would hope with a little bit of uh, introspection, and examination according to God's word, maybe according to the Ten Commandments, you would be like, oh yeah, I did, I did think of, I mean, fear, love, and trust sound, right? Okay, it's a little cliche now, I suppose, for us as Lutherans. Um, but fear would be like, I, I was thinking of myself in the ser- after the sermon a little bit. It's like, you know what I do every day? I go on my phone and I check my, my bank balance, my investment balance, and my crypto balance. I do that every day. I see how, how's it doing? Is it getting better, worse, you know? It's like, why does it even, I mean, bank balance matters because you have to pay the bills, but, but your investment balance, like, it doesn't matter. I don't need that today. That's for, like, hopefully decades, right? Uh, crypto balance is just a game I'm playing, and it's dumb, and whatever. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, who knows, right? But that's, like, 5%, you know, it's not a big deal. But why check it every day? Because you're worried about losing it, or, you wanna, or you're greedy and you want to gain it, Right? Yeah, so examine the heart, and you're like, oh, mm. I'm not just leaving that to God's care, right? But uh, Don knows about this, because this is what happens every, every month when we get um, our financial reports from, from our treasurer, right? And now all of a sudden, it's either a crisis, or it's either a minor or a major crisis, generally. <laughs> there, it's not usually like, oh, good news! Yeah. And it's like... Uh, I know of churches that don't even have budgets still. I don't know if you can do that with a school because we have a lot of responsibility. But I mean, if you just had a pastor, a secretary, or whatever, and just like, hey, look, we didn't make the, we didn't make it last week. You just tell the congregation next week. We didn't make it last week. We got some bills overdue. We need to pay. You know, and just ask for the generosity of people. And if you don't pay it, you overdue, and they take your church. I mean, that there you go. Who's that on? Oh, that's on you. That's one way to run a budget, right? <laughs> Lesson learn. Well, you tend not to spend very much because you have no idea how much you have. <laughs> you just see that you don't know how much you need or anything. I don't know if that's good stewardship. I'm not advocating that. But it, it is a way to live by faith, isn't it? So there is that, right? Um, and what is it? Like half of U.S. households live paycheck to paycheck, I think? Yeah. Don't, have, don't even have a month's emergency um, set aside. Yeah. So, yeah, that's hard. That's hard. 
All right, so what were we talking about? Oh, we prophecy. What? Oh, yeah, you could always just win the lottery, right? I actually have a comment about the blood. Oh, yes, the blood. I require the blood at your hand. Yeah. Well, I, I thought that um, the uh, phrase, his blood shall be upon his own head, was uh, interesting mm -hmm. compared to uh, the cry of the crowd, who is going to be upon us and our children. Yeah. Which. In contrast, they didn't actually believe it, but what they said was gospel. True. Yep. In contrast to this, which is... This is law. This is judgment, yeah. yeah. yeah contrasting his blood being upon his head, well, Jesus' blood would be, would be upon his head. This is why I don't understand the apostles at all. I don't understand them. Especially Peter. He's like, because he seems so... And we had it with James and John here yesterday or the day before. They seem so anxious to be apostles. And you're like, you realize that if Jesus gives you this responsibility to be preachers of his word, now the consequence of failure to preach is entirely on you, right? I mean, you, there, there's severe words of judgment against those who fail to do the job. You don't want to be a pastor. Sorry, Gabe. You don't want... You, <laughs> You don't want to do it. Well, do you really have a choice? <laughs> no, that's the point. You don't. No, it's you know, you're called to it. Right. Right. But I, but I would argue, I mean, this is true for a lot of vocations anyway, right? That have sacred responsibilities attached to it. Like parents, father, to teach the children their faith, right? That's a, that's a heavy responsibility. I don't think it's hard. I mean, it's only hard culturally and societally, but not as far as actually doing it. You just read it and you talk about it. We even have helpful tools like the small catechism, right? Large catechism. That's a pretty dress. Why are you whining? You shouldn't whine with a pretty dress on. <laughs> pretty dress, pretty person, right? Smiley face. <laughs> she thinks I'm weird. Uh, what were we talking about? I get distracted. Oh, the blood, yeah. So yeah, no, it's a, no, it's a burden. It's not, it's not easy. Um, but Jesus still calls it light and easy and a compared to the burden of, imagine what if he gave you to be a prophet and all you had was a word of judgment to speak for years, like Ezekiel. Now that's a, that's a heavy responsibility, yeah. You're like, oh, here, I'm going to make these li this little model of Jerusalem and I'm going to lay there for nine months every day. Or I'm going to bake bread on a, out of a pile of poop on fire. <laughs> Well, that's, you know, right. Where at least, like most of the time, thank, thanks be to God, my, you know, and always predominantly, the message is, you're forgiven, right? Jesus, Jesus died for you. He saved you. He is your life, your joy, your health, your wealth, your, what were all the things in the hymn? What is the world to me? My pleasure, my health, my, it's, it's all in there, right? It's all in Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So that's good news. So that, as far as being a heavy burden, not that heavy, um, but the, it's only heavy if you neglect it, right? Fail to do the job. So, uh, and that's always on, on the conscience of every pastor, right? Where have I fallen short? Where have I failed? Yeah, conscience, conscience. That's correct. All right, that's probably good on that. Therefore, all right, so again, the reminder, here's what your job was, watchman, or is. Now, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus you say, if our transgressions and our sins lie upon us and we pine away in them, how can we live? And then this is such a beautiful verse, right? I think it's almost a pivotal moment. Well, it's not quite the pivot, but we're getting close to it. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Okay. Now, there's a lot that we probably need to talk about here. Um, and I gave you quite a bit in a paragraph. Maybe we should start with that, and then we'll see where this takes us, okay? Um, but you've heard this before, right? Maybe you even know it by heart. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their sins sure and live. Up, stands one. Stands one. Oh, it's actually a hymn. It's actually the same stanza for Okay. Uh, and by the way, again, it's a... It's almost exactly the same as chapter 18, verse whatever. We've heard this before. Somewhere between 21 and 25 of chapter 18. All right. Uh, here's what I write. 
For the first time in the entire book, the people, verse 10, admit their guilt is the cause of their suffering, depicting themselves according to Yahweh's prediction. Finally, they say, what you've said is true. That's effectively what they're saying here, right? If all this is true about us, well, then how are we going to live? That's right where God wants them, right? That's where he wants you to. Well, then who can be saved? Huh, right? That's Paul in Romans. The law has done its work, which is in Latin, this is one of the few Latin phrases I think you should memorize, lex semper accusat. Can you say that? Lex semper accusat, right. The law, lex, semper, always. You know that from the uh, Marine slogan, right? Sem- what? Not semper. Semper what? Fidelis? Semper fi. Yeah. Semper fidelis or semper fi, for short. That's you said, like, Marine. Always faithful. Yeah, always faithful. Right. But this is the law always, and accusat's not too hard to figure out. Accuses, right? Yeah. The law always accuses. That's its work. But... Um, a gospel-less vacuum exists, right? Well, how are we to live? We've not received that word. Uh, maybe they did, but they forgot it. Uh, which Yahweh will fill in in chapters 34 to 48. All right, so if you don't understand this whole law gospel um, dialectic, if you like, or, or uh, comparison, um, I gave you the citations in our book of Concord, which is our confession as a Christian congregation of what we believe about this. So, Augsburg Confession 4, Apology 4, Small Cult Articles, Part 3, Article 2, Paragraphs 4 to (laughs) 5. You want me to keep going? I'll keep going. Uh, Part 3, Article 3, Paragraphs 1 through 8, Formula of Concord, Epitome, Formula of Concord, Solid Declaration, Article 5, on the Law and the Gospel. All right? And they're great summaries, actually. They're not hard to read. The, Apolo- uh, the Augsburg Confession is the simplest. That's where you could start and then work your way through. Luther and the Small Cold Articles is actually um, a little bit more colloquial, so that might, be, that might make more sense to you. Uh, the formula deals with some issues that happened in the Lutheran Church um, where they didn't actually agree with the Augsburg Confession, um, and we had to fix that. All right, so Yahweh is going to agree with the people's diagnosis, but contest the despair they infer from it. All right, so this is, I think this is a really important point. The law always accuses, but the goal of the law is never to leave you in despair. Does that make sense? And we've talked about this in terms of God's alien and proper work. You remember that? So the opus alienum and the opus propter, right? God's alien work is the law, is to, to bring to our knowledge a recognition of sin, right? And so that we know it in our hearts and we confess it with our mouth. Right? But he know, that's, that's alien, that's only secondary or preparatory for us to receive, Esther, stop, to receive the proper work of God, which is to forgive us our sins. We didn't need the law to be sinners. We were already sinners before the law was proclaimed. Now, that might be new to you. Maybe you've heard me say it. I'm thinking other ways. But that's the essential assertion of Paul in Galatians, that the law was given because of trespasses, not because there were... Not because they weren't sinners, but because they were sinners. Then the law was given so that they, were, they would become even more sinners to the point where they would all cry out, just like these people, well, we have nothing to give. How can we live? We have no life. You've killed us. Hmm? All right. So I'm saying a lot here. But again, you can get more from uh, our confessions. By the way, the, the Book of Concord is available online. You don't have to own a copy. You can, just, you can look up these references bookofconcord.org or thebookofconcord.org. There's like different ones. Just Google it. Don't Google it. Duck, duck, go it. I don't even know. However you want to find it. God ultimately backed up his oath. This is the key. Oh, he gives an... I'm sorry, I skipped a bit. But contest the despair they infer from it. They must relearn, learn or relearn, Yahweh's nature and ultimate intent for them. So he gives an oath based on his own life to counter the despair of life, right? So they're despairing of life. How can we live? And he gives an oath. As I live, according to my life, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live, right? So he's actually staking their future life on his own life. You see that? As I live, so you will live. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I didn't, yeah, okay, anyway. 
Uh, and here it is. God ultimately backed up his oath, this oath, verse 11, by sacrificing his own son on the cross for the life of the world. Gott selbst ist tot, Ethan. God himself is dead. God himself is dead, right? That's from one of my favorite Good Friday hymns that, unfortunately, I only make you sing because I like it so much. Oh, sorrow, dread, our God is dead. Upon the cross extended. All 15 stanzas. But they're so short. Wait, you don't have all 15 stanzas. Wait, there's 15 stanzas for... for yeah, and, and TLH, yeah. 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 They're not long. I mean, each one is like, what, 15 seconds? Okay, maybe it's 20 seconds. All right. So he parries their rhetorical question, how can we then live, right, um, with his own? Do I desire the death of the wicked, right? Should you die, O house of Israel? There's his, right? Yahweh, the enemy of his people, who draws the sword against them to annihilate them because of their disobedience. We had that right above, right? It's Yahweh's sword. When? Yahweh, at the same time, however, the God who sets up a watchman for his people, who will warn them of the sword in which he himself comes, thus tries to make his sword ineffectual. <laughs> Do I need to read that again? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me read the last sentence, then we'll come back to it. God himself is the only one who can avert death and provide everlasting life. This he has done in the death and resurrection of his son. See Psalm 16 and 22, which we might do here in a minute. All right, so Yahweh, who is the enemy of his people, because of their rebellion, right? Who draws the sword against them to annihilate them because of their disobedience. Yahweh at the same time, however, the God who sets up a watchman for his people, who will warn them of the sword in which he himself comes, thus tries to make his sword ineffectual. All right, so Luther says um, that the key to being a, good, being a theologian, the only way you can actually be a theologian is to be able to distinguish between this and that, between one thing and another thing. All right, so law and gospel would be an example of that, right? Um, that doesn't mean that those two things aren't um, uh, opposed to each other or stand at the same time. So he'll call those He'll call that a paradox, right? When you have two things that, that are both true, but they don't seem, they can't, you don't think they can exist at the same time, but they're both revealed by God as true, right? That's a paradox. Um, a dialectic is the law is given by God and the gospel is given by God and they're opposed to each other. Well, how can both be true then, right? Why would God give a word that opposes himself, right? Satan can't be opposed to himself, can God? <laughs> Those are interesting questions, right? So being able to distinguish between ideas that are both true at the same time. Um, for a great discussion on this, by the way, it's the most recent episode of a podcast on the 1517 Podcast Network, which you know I'm a part of, but um, it's a podcast called The Outlaw God with Dr. Stephen Paulson, who's uh, a little controversial amongst people in the Missouri Senate, but need not be. We've read him on banned books. You've heard him there. Um, but he did a discussion here in the most recent episode about... Uh, Luther's interaction with Desiderius Erasmus in the bondage of the will. You've heard, heard me probably refer to the bondage of the will before. Um, the formula of Concord, Article 10, I believe it is, or, 11, or 9, I can't remember, um, refers to the bondage of the will as the definitive, the definitive work for us as Lutherans to read when it comes to understanding um, the nature of God's will and our will. All right? Um, and the problem with both God's will and our will is, as Luther says, in the bondage of the will with Erasmus, is that Erasmus can't hold things in tension. He can't distinguish between things, and he conflates them instead of distinguishing them. He confuses ideas. He doesn't, and so in one place, it means this, and in another place, it means that. And rather than saying, wait a minute, when God talks about, about righteousness, he means the righteousness of his son. He doesn't mean our righteousness. And we, even when it says ours or my, it's the righteousness we've received in Jesus. That's, that's Luther, right? Um, whereas maybe other terms you might, it's just about, what do you want to say? Um, literacy, right? Or if, you, if you're not reading the Bible, if you're listening, listening comprehension. Unit one, right? If you took standardized tests, you remember those? That was my favorite part of, because it was the thing I did the worst at. So I don't know. Okay. I don't listen to people. What can I say? I'm a great pastor. Really just go back to that. Like, there's nothing we can do. Nothing. Right, but... Ah, yes. But this is Erasmus's problem. 
because he conflates the will um, to like live, live in this world, you know, to decide to go to church or stay home. Well, that's not a good example. The, the decision to listen to your alarm clock and wake up or the decision to stay in bed and turn off your alarm clock, right? He, he confuses that will or to walk out in front of the bus or not <laughs> to stay on the sidewalk. He confuses that will with the, uh, the will of faith, if you like, if you want to call it that. That's probably not a great way to say it, but, you know. And he says, well, because we have this will that we can do this or that, then that means we can also love God, choose him, follow after him, decide for him, right? Believe in him, that that's, that's according to our will. Uh, and Luther, that's where Luther makes this distinction. He says, wait a minute, You're, we're talking about two categorically different things. Even though they use the same word, will, they're not, they don't have, they don't, they aren't the same. Um, according to God's revelation, actually, according to what God has told us, they're not the same. Uh, and Erasmus can't do that, right? So he can't distinguish between things. This happens sometimes in the church. People treat baptism and the Lord's Supper as if, as if they're the same thing. I mean, obviously they're different. One's water, one's bread and wine. And obviously you hear different words with each. But because you hear different words, then those words actually command or demand different things, right? So the Lord's Supper isn't given without examination, without instruction, whereas baptism often is, like to infants, right? That's because different words are attached. God has said different things about them. Even though we, both, we call them both sacraments, mysteries, we don't treat them the same because God doesn't. He has different words, all right? So that's another example where you don't want to confuse things. All right, so here, why did I bring all this up? Ah, yes, distinguishing. Um, how then can we, how can, how can we talk about God in two different ways at the same time? That's where we were going with this. Thank you. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> on the one hand, God is the one who brings judgment upon his people for their unbelief. He is the sword that has brought them into exile in Babylon. He did that. We've heard that over and over in Ezekiel, right? Not just on Israel, though, but also on the Gentile nations. He's destroyed Pharaoh in Egypt. We've heard that for the last few weeks, last few classes, right? That was God's doing. Or, or Tyre, we heard about Tyre being overcome, right, by Babylon. And eventually he's going to overcome Babylon, too. And Nebuchadnezzar, who has a really short reign, all things considered, even though he gets so much attention in the Bible, you know, be it from Daniel or whoever, Ezekiel. All right, so that's, that's, that's God. But at the same time, God actually is always working to uh, make the sword worth nothing, right? So the sword comes along to kill you, and then God says, that's okay, I'll raise you from the dead afterwards, which makes it ineffectual, right? Yeah, it killed you because of your unbelief, but I'll raise you from the dead, so what are you worried about? Like, how, what? <laughs> that doesn't seem right. God repents of the disaster? Yeah, there's that aspect too. Yeah, there's other places where you might say, that doesn't actually make sense. It's like, well, wait a minute. First and foremost, we depend entirely, not upon our suppositions and our logical inferences and our understanding of how God should operate <laughs> from our perspective, but rather on what he's told us about himself. And so everything is about being conformed to him, not him conforming to us. Uh, C.S. Lewis calls this, he has a book actually called God in the Dock. You know, the dock is the, the booth for the charged one, right? So Lewis is like, that's, this is what modern man does. He puts God into the judgment seat. And you are the judge who's putting God on trial. Instead of actually the other way around. Where God's the judge and he puts us on trial. Yeah, yeah. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Yeah, that's like, well, yeah, that's putting Jesus on the <coughs> Mm -hmm. What would Jesus have as one of us do? Right. So it is, I, I think, uh, actually, Vicki, you made this point earlier, maybe in regards to the will, or what we were talking about then, but it's also true with what I wrote here, is that God is not only the one who kills, but he's the one who makes alive. So he's on both sides of the equation, if you like, or the balance. Right? He kills and he makes alive. He gives and he takes away. He lifts up the humble, and he humbles the proud. He's like, well, wait a minute, how can he be? I want to be responsible for something in this equation, right? I want to be the, maybe if you're in despair, I want to be the one responsible for my own death. It's, be, it's my fault. You're like, well, yeah, that's true, right? But then you're like, but that's, but what about the gospel? What has God done for you in Christ? Right? And then flip it the other way around. 
and say, I'm not responsible for my actions, but I am responsible for my salvation. Which is, that's probably today more than the other, right? People aren't really despairing. I mean, maybe they are secretly or in a hidden way. But generally, people are like, oh, I'm just born this way. God made me this way. Right? Which is blaming God for your behavior and your whatever it is. Right? So God made me this way. He's to blame for my sin. But I'm responsible to, for my salvation. You know? Because I'm going to work hard and I'm going to be the best person I can be. Like, that doesn't... Now you're putting yourself on that side of the equation. That's not helpful either. And then what's, what's incredible is that actually God's on both sides of the equation. God gives the law to bring all things under sin. And then God gives the gospel to raise you from the dead. And what do you do about it? Well, you receive it. <laughs> but, but even the receiving of it isn't by your will. You don't have to want it. You don't even have to like it. You don't have to accept it. I, I think I threw that out in the sermon today, didn't I? Right? Like, um, like the, men, the monks and the, and the intentionally poverty, right? Where people would give up their stuff and then they would go serve in the church and depend upon the charity of the church, um, whether it's in monastic life or something like that. Um, as if that was their choice. And I, I think, I, did I say it? That even if they didn't do it, God would take it away from them anyway. <laughs> right? Uh, they think it was their choice. And maybe it was just God working through his word to say, you love your stuff too much. Maybe it's best just to give it away and go and, uh, you know, go, uh, you know, live dependent upon other people. I've seen that with relatively wealthy people. They've done that, especially end of life. You know, you see people being very generous and just giving away because what's the point? Especially if you don't have children or something like that, right? Family to care for. Even then they should take take care of yourself. You don't need my money. All right. Uh, Where were we? So two things at once. Oh, I was going to show you a song. You know Psalm 22 because we hear it every year at, uh, on Monday, Thursday. So you probably know that pretty well. And on Good Friday. Uh, but listen to, uh, I said Psalm 22 and I wanted to type. Tw- I can't talk and type at the same time, apparently. Here we go. Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O my soul, this is all Jesus saying, speaking, by the way. O my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take their names on my lips. O Lord, you are my portion, or the portion of my inheritance in my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. You get the idea. Uh, let's see, where do I want to go? Here it is. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh will also rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Right? So there's Jesus' own prayer by way of David saying, I'm going to take care of these people. Right? They are my good inheritance. All right. So again, distinguishing and two things can be true at the same time, even if they seem contradictory or paradoxical. How can God bring the sword against them, but also want to deliver them from the very sword he brings? But that's repentance for the forgiveness of sins, I suppose. All right. Any questions, comments so far? Where were we? The next part. We want to get, we want to get to the big pivot. Uh, this is a repeat again of chapter, what did I say up above? Chapter 18, verses 21 to 25, basically. Maybe a little expanded. Therefore you, O son of man, say to the children of your people, the righteous of the righteous man shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall because of it in the day that he turns from his wickedness. Nor shall the righteous be able to live because of his righteousness in the day that he sins. So here here echoes, Jesus repeats this in various ways, right? I did not come for the righteous, but for sinners that they repent. It's the same idea, right? The righteous person with his righteousness isn't going to be saved. But the wicked man who returns from his wickedness will be. Because what is he turning to? Not his righteousness, his right doing, but the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That follow? Right, you see this with the thief on the cross would be a great example of that, right? 
And people are always like, well, maybe he was baptized. Maybe he did this or that. And it's like, no, he repented and Jesus forgave him. And then he died and he was with Jesus in paradise. That's, that's it. Was he a wicked man? Absolutely. Did he have anything that he could claim coming from himself? Not really. Did he ever go make amends to all the people he killed and their families and weep on TV or something? No, no, no. All right. When I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, but he trusts in his own righteousness and commits iniquity, none of his righteous works shall be remembered. Lord, when did we see you? Hungry or thirsty, right? right. There's this divine forgetfulness that you don't even know the influence that you've had as, as faithful Christians and, and the gifts that God has delivered to others by you. Because if, if you knew them, guess what would happen? If you knew all the good things that God had worked in you and through you, guess what would happen? Yes, I did it. You'd start to take credit for it. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, pride. Exactly. Yeah. Not cry, pride. <sighs> Again, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die if he turns from his sin and does what is lawful and right, that is, repents and <laughs> confesses uh, forgiveness in Christ. If the wicked restores the pledge, the testament, gives back what was stolen, walks in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of the sins which he has committed shall be remembered against him. Right? He has done what is lawful and right. He shall surely live. All right. So that's you, right? You are the wicked. Sorry. Hate to break it to you. Uh, but you're the wicked who came to church today to confess your sins, right? To have them forgiven and never remembered again, right? That you would live, that you would live in, in, in Christ, right? And maybe you do that every day. You confess your sins each morning and each night, uh, or each night, and then each morning you ask the Lord to keep you from sins again, which would be good. That's what Luther instructs, right? And so, and he, these are some of the prototypical or stereotypical ways that repentance is evidenced in the life of the people. Is re, like we talked about, restitution, right? Give back what he has stolen or um, restoring the pledge. So if he made an oath and then he broke the oath, that he restores the oath, right? Um, yeah, or the statutes of life, which re, could refer to the commandments of God, if you like. Right? And then he shall surely live. So a life lived... Uh, in repentance for the forgiveness of sins, made holy by the Holy Spirit, who then guides, um, guides you to live in part now and in, in eternity fully um, according to God's word. All right. Yet, hmm, turn the page. Yet, the children of your people say, this is the problem, right? How can God both bring the sword and bring Make his sword ineffectual. So the people say, children of the people say, the way of the Lord is not fair. I love that. There's different ways to translate that word. Equitable. Oh, that's even better. Today, right? It's not equitable. Not enough to have equal opportunity, you have equal result, right? Thank you, Karl Marx. All right. It's not fair. But it is, it is their way which is not f Oh, no, that's, that's the end. But it is their way which is not fair. When the righteous turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall die because of it. And that's completely fair, <laughs> is God's point, right? That's exactly what should happen. But when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is lawful and right, he shall live because of it. And the assertion here is, that's what fairness is. It's not that you've lived a life, that you've worked all day in the heat of the day, and you got your denarius at the end of the day, and then the other guy comes along in the 11th hour and gets the same, the same gift of a denarius at the end of the day. That's not fair. And what does God say? No, that's actually fairness. Is that everybody is saved by the blood of Jesus. What better, what, how more fair could you, equitable could you be? That it's not based off of sex or, um, or bloodline or, or even work or our righteousness or what? Wealth, prosperity, any of the things we've done, right? It's all entirely a gift from God. Yeah? The way of the Lord is not fair, O house of Israel. I will judge every one of you according to his own ways. So that's always the danger, right? When you say to God, I don't like how you're doing this. I don't like that you save that person. And God say, okay, then I'll judge you in the same way that you want me to judge him. Of course, as you mentioned in your sermon, hmm. on the same gospel reading as a year ago, uh -huh. 
Oh, you remember last year's sermon? Good for you. Anybody else? Well, specifically, you talked about how, in terms of human morality, God's way of salvation is not fair. It's immoral, yeah. It's completely unfair and yeah. unjust yeah. that he would... Yeah, I said Jesus was the unjust steward today, didn't I? Yeah, he's unjust. According to our standards, right? Yeah, it's exactly this. Maybe I got it from here. Who knows? Yeah, we don't want what we deserve. <laughs> Right, but that's precisely what he says. If you want others to be judged according to that standard, then you yourself will be judged according to it. Right, this is love your neighbor as yourself. It's the same idea, but in a different way, right? Love your neighbor as you want to be loved, right? So if you don't, you know, I don't know. What, I'm trying to give an example. If you want others to, like, care for you, oh, what's the, um, what, it's a parable coming up, right, with the, um, Making friends by means of unrighteous wealth. Actually, we heard that today. Yeah, we heard that today, too. Right? Make, make for yourselves friends by means of unrighteous wealth. That was our parable today. Right? And it's like, well, wait a minute. Well, that's exactly what we're talking about. It's like, squander stuff on other people so that when you don't have it, then they can squander it on you. Wouldn't that be beautiful, right? Oh, you have, you know, you have a need this morning. I'll take care of it. And they're like, well, wait a minute. What do you expect in return? I don't expect anything. And then when you have a need, you say, they say, well, can I help you? And you're like, yeah, sure, that's right. But, oh, we hate charity, by the way. It's so hard. Nobody wants to receive charity. Except for, of course, the people who we think are scoundrels who are manipulating our charitable instinct to take from us. Anyway, never mind. Now, yeah. so if you want to be judged by your own ways, um, God will do that. But that's not what you want. You want his fairness, right? That the wicked turn from their wickedness to what is lawful and right, that's to God's word, and live because of it. That's what you want, right? Yeah, that's what faith says. Don't judge me according to my iniquities. Judge me according to your righteousness. What you say is right. <laughs> Not what I think is right, because what I think is right is completely wrong. Good so far? All right, and then the big pivot. Dun, 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 dun. This is what we, the moment we've all been waiting for, because his, his, his preaching does not need to be, oh, everything's doom and gloom. Because actually, the thing will happen. <laughs> it came to pass in the twelfth year of our captivity. So he's been preaching this way a long time. What? Would you just keep going to church, by the way? <laughs> yeah. If you had Ezekiel as your pastor? Hmm. Yeah. In the tenth month, on the fifth day of the month, whatever that is, somebody can look it up. That one who had escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said, there it is. The city has been captured, or the city has fallen, or the city has been smitten. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is that? Hakadod Aro. Hakadod Aro. Just two words in Hebrew. The city has fallen. It's been smitten. This is the pivotal moment. Um, I don't think it's too much to say that this is also saying it is finished. Because everything's going to change now. All of the darkness and the doom and the earthquakes and what else happened, you know, with Jesus' crucifixion, you know, which is all the, basically been the preaching of the last 32 chapters. Patrick, put your feet down. All of that now is finished because the city has been captured. It's done. And then we're going to pivot. It's like going from BC to AD. It's like going, what else did I say? I'll give you some other ideas. No, I mean, the cross would be a good place too. Right? The fall of Jerusalem now vindicates the doom prophecies of Ezekiel together with Yahweh, who had some, um, who had shown, not some, I don't know, my typing got bad by the end, shown himself to be the true Lord. All right. Now the hand of the Lord had been upon me um, the evening before the man came who had escaped, and he opened my mouth. So when he came to me in the morning, my mouth was opened and I was no longer mute. Now, I mean, we could take that a number of different ways, but has Ezekiel not been preaching? He did. I mean, I don't know how long it was from the oracles of judgment against Egypt. How long had it been since those? Anybody do the math? The 12th year on the 15th day of the month. Right, and now we're on the what? 12th year... In the tenth month, on the fifth day of the month, yeah. Sorry, whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. It's a there's a little delay here apparently. 
there we are on the fifth day of the month. So, you know, it's been a little bit. So maybe he hasn't been preaching for a few months. I don't think that's what's being said here. Well, that's true. Maybe that's it. How about we think about it even more broadly? Now that Jerusalem is destroyed, the oracles of judgment against Jerusalem have been fulfilled. And now it's time to preach the gospel. So now his tongue is going to be loosed to confess um, eschatologically, end times kind of thing, the res- restoration of Israel and Jerusalem and Judah, right? And the Gentiles actually too. Death out of life, all of that. Now he can finally speak. Maybe what Ezekiel has been hoping to speak this whole time. I don't think, he doesn't strike me like Jonah or somebody who's like, I really want to just go tell them they're all going to die and then and go to hell and then, and then leave like Nineveh. And the guy's like, no, that's not where you're going to actually get to preach. They're going to actually repent and live for a time. And Jonah's like, why? That's not, I don't want to do that. That's not fun. I want to be the guy on the street corner with the, the end of the world is near, you know? I'm like, no, no way to go through life, son. So uh, yeah, he opened his mouth. And now, and so we're going to hear, actually, um, we're going to do a theological exposition of what just happened and then lead us right into the gospel, right? So what did I say? At the same time, the survivor from Jerusalem and the existence of the remnant of Babylon show Yahweh also to be Savior, whose prophecies of salvation will be fulfilled. Right? Oh, maybe that's an important note. If God promises destruction and then it doesn't happen, what might you think? If he promises that you will be destroyed and then it doesn't happen, or that he will kill you and it doesn't happen, then what might you think? There's multiple options. So he's not going to do it? He's not going to do it. He's not, his, faithful. he's not faithful to his word? Yeah. Or maybe, yeah, but he would tell you that. At least he does in the Bible. Yeah, he'll tell you. Or if he changes his mind, he usually tells you too, right? Like with Moses. And, but it's always on the basis of intercession. It's not so arbitrary, right? They pray to him and then they cry out to the Lord and he hears them in their distress and he answers them. Yeah, but that may, if he doesn't follow through, we talked about this with rules, didn't we? Not following through on rules? Yeah, then what, what are the rules if you don't follow through on them? They're nothing. Yeah, they're worthless. Dorothy. Shh. Quietly. She doesn't understand that word. <laughs> right, so um, that's why I say God is vindicated right now. Every, change that setting. How do I change that setting? Where is it? Ah, right here. Never. I don't know. Never. All right, good. Now, how do I get back to where I was? Uh Uh-oh. I don't know. It's not that one. Let's do that. And then we'll do that. And now we're back. Okay. Yeah, I turned that off. Never do that again. <laughs> Where, I like got distracted. Oh, yes. God has vindicated his word, right? He's done what he said, right? So he said that he's going to kill you and make you alive, and he did that today, right? He brought your sin to remembrance, and then he forgave you, raised you from the dead again, right? And he does that over and over, right? As he promised, as he promised. So, yeah, God's threats are not vain threats. His sword is sharp and it's two-edged. Piercing to the division of bone and marrow, right? To quote the apostle, bone and marrow, yeah. That sounds like it might hurt. I say it's like a scalpel, though. It's surgical. But he's removing that, that which gets in the way of, of faith. Oh, I said that in the sermon. Hey, how about that? All right, good. So here we are at the pivotal moment. I was no longer mute and Jerusalem's destroyed. So now we have to talk about restoration, right? And of course that restoration is not exactly probably what they thought it was going to be, which is clear by the, in the ministry of Jesus, right? That they were expecting a different kind of restoration than what he was came to bring a different kind of kingdom, a different kind of King, all of that. So we'll, we'll get into that over the next, how many chapters? 15 chapters, 34 to 48. Is that 15 or 14? I can't do math. 16. Uh, 15 chapters. 15 chapters of good news. Are you ready? 
Yeah, with a little law in there still, because you can't avoid it. All right, so God be with you all. Uh, not next week, though. Next week you have voters meeting, and I'm not here. So we'll resume in a couple weeks. Adios. Wiedersehen. Tschüss. Go away now.